We're kind of pretty much familiar with one another, family here. But I want to jump into some things. Before we do, let's pray first and ask the Lord's help as we do come together. So would you pray with me right now? Our Father in heaven, we do want to first come before you. And Lord, we do magnify you as we just sung about that you are great. Your mercy is more. That Lord, there are countless reasons to magnify your name. Not only because of what you've done for us in Christ, but because of who you are. And Lord, you are a holy God, a righteous God, compassionate God, loving God, merciful God. And Lord, we exalt you. And Father, we don't dare to do anything without you. So we do ask that you would come and and use this weekend to glorify your name. I pray you would give us eyes to see your goodness and glory, that you would soften our hearts to, to, to prepare to receive from your word. I pray you would work in the soul of each individual soul in this room, that we would see your goodness and glory and be drawn to it. I pray, Lord, if there are any even in this room who do not know you in the saving of their sins, that today would be their day of their salvation. I pray, Father, that we would be built up in Christ, that your word would go forth with clarity and precision. And ultimately, Lord, we we just pray that we would get to know you even more, love you more, and follow you even more closely. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so... The theme for this weekend, as you know, growing in Christ. You can hear me okay? Growing in Christ, by the way, since my son was sick all week. I don't know if you remember in the summer, I lost my voice. And the whole week, I've been praying, like, Lord, don't, don't, let, don't let it happen again. <laughs> I can't do that twice. <laughs> um, so I've been taking all kinds of vitamins, but I'm good. So I just want to make sure you can hear me. But we're all good to go. Um, the theme, growing in Christ, right? That's our theme this, this weekend is to grow in Christ. As a Christian, you ask the question, how do I grow in my faith? You ever ask that? Like, how do you grow in your faith? How can I grow in where I am right now into deeper depths of Christ's likeness? Maybe there are times where you feel like you're just stagnant in your Christian walk. You feel like you're, it's, it's hard for you to, to press forward. You're weary. Maybe you're tired, confused. You're struggling. There's all sorts of reasons that could get us to feel like, I just want to grow. That's a common struggle, and you should want to grow. And in fact, a true believer in Christ, one evidence, if if you're truly in Christ, is that you want to grow in Christ, that you are actually hungry for Christ, that you know you're not where you should be, but you want to get further. That's one evidence that maybe the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. The false convert, the one who says they're a Christian, but really aren't because they're maybe self-deceived, they don't really even care about growing in Christ. In fact, they don't even know if they've grown in Christ because they're not even asking those kinds of questions. They're not thinking about it because the Spirit of God does not live within them, so they don't really care, but they don't really consciously care. They just think like, yes, I know I should grow in Christ, but it really doesn't matter to them. And that's how many people are just deceived because this whole topic really doesn't matter. I don't really care. I, I, I can profess Christ But to grow in Christ, I don't need that. I already have Christ. I have what I need. I have the basics. And many times, that's just someone who is just self-deceived. Now, I hope that's not the case for anyone here. But if it is you, just I want to set some ground rules as we begin this weekend. All right? And these are some serious ground rules. And I want you to take this to heart. There's, There's one thing I really want you to embrace, if you will. And that is honesty. I don't want you to feel like you have to regurgitate the right answers to your leaders, to Pastor David, to me, to anyone. Don't feel like you have to give us the right answers. You should feel, have the liberty, the license to be honest with where you really are at. There's some who came up this weekend who probably are struggling Who came up this weekend, I I say I'm a Christian, people always think I'm a Christian, my family's a Christian, but I really don't know if I'm a Christian. If I were to die today, I really don't know where I could go. You should have the license to be honest, because I want you to be honest with where you're really at. I don't want a facade, I don't want fakeness, I just want a genuine um, profession of really really where you're at. I'm struggling, I, I profess Christ, I don't know if it's really there. Or maybe even if you don't even believe none of this, you know you're supposed to because your family is, or you're at a Christian camp, I'm supposed to say I'm a Christian, but if you're not really there, that's fine, just be honest with where you're really at. And with that, if I can also add, if that is you, you don't buy into this whole Christianity thing, you don't buy in that the Bible is the word of God, you don't buy into all this. If you don't, 
then you should have the license to be honest. But if I can also press you to also not only be honest, but to also be humble. Be a humble listener. Because don't only just be there, but be willing to listen from mature Christians, people who are familiar with the faith, and be humble enough to at least listen to what the content is of Christianity. So if you are saying, like, I just don't know, I'm just on the fence, if that's where you're at and you're honest, I'm glad you're honest, but also be humble and be willing to listen. I just want, if you don't get it by now, I just want you to have the license to be honest with where you're at. Don't waste the next 72 hours or however many hours we're here. Don't waste this weekend, all right? Who knows? We might not even see Sunday morning, Monday morning. We might not even be there. Who knows? At the end of the day, just be honest with where you're at. Is that all good? You're good with that? Yeah? Now, if we're going, growing in Christ, if that is our topic, we need to ask the question, yeah, how do we grow in Christ? And really what I want to do and spend this first session is really getting us to understand how we can even grow in Christ. Why can we grow in Christ? Why is this even possible? This is a big topic, and we'll scratch the surface even over the next few days. But we want to first answer the question is, is how can I even grow in Christ? Why is it even even possible for me to grow in Christ? Well, we're going to be in 2 Peter this, this evening. So if you're not already open to it, but turn your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, as Peter is writing this letter, church history tells us that he is writing this letter from a jail cell. And in fact, not only is he writing from a jail cell, but he has imminent death before him. That he is heading for persecution under Nero, who was just a wicked king and wicked, wicked ruler, and he had just death knocking on his door. He knew it. He knew that he was soon going to be face-to-face with the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew his death was coming. But here, in that context, Peter writes this letter. I think it's fascinating, because as he knows death is coming to him, imminent death, where does he spend his time talking to the people of God? Knowing that death is soon approaching him, this is what he gives his readers to really know. It's almost like if you knew that you had one last chance to see your loved ones, your brothers, your sister, your parents, whomever it was, if you knew you had one last chance, one last conversation with them, what would you say? And here, Peter uses that one last hurrah, if you will, and anchors it here. And he starts it off here with, to me, one of the most profound truths for us as believers, that's where he begins it. And I think it behoove us if we really understood what he's saying and how he goes about saying it. He's concerned ultimately with the health of the believer. He's concerned with the health of these churches as they're dispersed. And there's obviously threats against the church itself at this time. But he's most concerned with their well-being. So let's first read it and we'll kind of go into some things. But let's read chapter two. I'm sorry, chapter one, second Peter. The first 11 verses, we'll just read. We're going to start at verse 3 and go through verse 11. But for context, let's, let's read verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us Everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, 
be all the more diligent to make certain about its calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Big truths here. I call this picture the snapshot of the Christian life, where he's given us a a full throttle picture here of who we are, what our mission is, and what our hope is. You see a snapshot here of the Christian life. Now, before we go into it, I want you to look at what I didn't read. Verse 12, right after it, he says, after he said these, these, these big truths here, he says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. Now, did you catch that here? He says right after these things he just said to us, these big truths, he said right after that, so therefore, I will always remind you of these things, even though you already know them and are established in them. So the truths that we're going to walk through this evening, in other words, he's saying these aren't new truths. That if you're in Christ, these truths are, are, these truths are already true of you. But what he's doing here is reminding you of what has, already, what has already been done in you. You catch that? That he's reminding them of something they already know. It's like when your parents tell you the same thing. Yes, I know, Mom. No, don't tell me, don't tell me you know. I'm telling you, reminding you again because you're going to forget. Right? And what happens? We forget. <laughs> but So he's reminding us of something that we already know. This is not new. It's something we already know, and it's already been established in us. So really what we're going to talk about this evening is reminders. We're going to be reminded of something that we must be reminded of, because if you forget this, you won't grow, and you will constantly be frustrated in your walk with Christ, because you will not realize who you are and what you're called to do and the hope that awaits you. If you forget this, if you are not reminded of this, you will stay stuck in the mud. So we need to be reminded of this so we know why we can't even grow. So these are reminders we're going to look at. So this passage we just read in verses 3 through 11, it it reveals three necessary reminders so that you can grow in Christ. Three necessary reminders so that you can grow in Christ. And what are these necessary reminders? The first one we're going to look at is you need to know your nature. You need to know your nature. I did a, a search, a quick search, and Siri helped me out, so... If I'm wrong, you can't fact check me because nobody has signal. So (laughs) if I were to ask you, what is the smallest country in the entire world? Does anybody know what the smallest country is? I see now I'm intimidated because I got some quick hands. What's the smallest country? Oh, okay. I was right. Syria is right. Me and Syria got it. Yeah. Vatican City. All right. We're good to go. When I heard Vatican City, I heard a city. I I asked Syria, country, and you told me Vatican City. So, you know, I was doubting her, but now I feel more confident. We're good. Vatican City, right? The smallest country in the entire world. It's a, they call, it's a city state, I believe, but still uh, the smallest country. Now, could you imagine what it would take to overthrow Vatican City? If anybody wanted to overthrow it, I think it said it, the whole length of the city is less than a mile, I believe. So it's not long. But what would it take to overthrow that city? Nothing, right? Now, if I were to tell you individually, I need you to go into Vatican City and I need you to overthrow it. By yourself. Would you endeavor to do that? I hope not. Right? No way. Why not? Because you're just you. You have no resources. Now, if I were to tell you, I need you to go overthrow the Vatican City, and you have the entire resources of the United States of America, the Army, the Marine, the Navy, and the Air Force with you, how would you feel about that? I can do that easily. I don't even need all four of those branches. I could do it with Space Force, right? Like, I don't, I don't need that. Like, I, if I had the entire resources of the United States of America and I'm going into Vatican City, that is no problem for me, right? So in a sense, that's just a small picture here. But look what Peter says here about your resources that you have in Christ. Looking again at verse 3, he says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to you, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Did you catch that? 
Now, let me read that again, right? Look at it. Now, seeing that his divine power has granted to us most things for life and godliness. Is that what it says? No. Seeing his divine power has granted to us almost everything for life and godliness. Seeing his divine power has granted to us almost everything you need. No, no, no. What does it say? His divine power has granted to us everything. Everything for what? Life and and godliness. You catch that? This is huge here. Everything that you would need to live a godly life, it's been granted to you. So what I'm saying, you must know your nature. This, these first verse right here, verse three, it really lays the foundation of everything else within this passage, because we must understand the grand truth of what he's saying here. He's saying that when God saved you, he granted to you everything that you would need to live a godly life. We're going to get technical for a second, but I think it's helpful. When he says here, granted, this tense here is what's called the perfect tense. Perfect tense. And what this perfect tense means is it is a definite action that takes place in time and it has continual impact ongoing. So in other words, when it says he has granted to you everything you need for life and godliness, he says everything there, it's granted to you. It's, it's granted to you how? Through the true knowledge of him who called you. So when God saved you, he granted to you at one point in time, at the time of your regeneration, everything you would need for life and godliness. And that same power is still available for you the next day, the next day, today, and tomorrow, and the next day and the next day, and the next day, and it will never, ever end. So in other words, when you were born again, when God opened your eyes to the glory of Christ, he gifted to you, he granted to you everything that you would need to please him, to live a life that is well-pleasing in his sight, and you still have that power today, and you will have it tomorrow, and it will never, ever end until you hit the grave, and when you see Christ, he'll give you everything at that point. He's given to you everything, everything. This is a huge promise. This is the very foundation of what he says to the rest of this book. And really, we cannot have enough grasp on this truth of what he's saying here. This is a huge, huge promise. I remember when I was reading this, um, actually, I read this verse in seminary, but I was reading a book. And I was reading this book, and he just randomly quoted this very verse here. And I don't know about you, but there are times when you've read passages in Scripture, and then other times you go back and read it again. And you ever have those moments where it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit will like open your eyes and like, whoa, and it hits you like a train. Like, I knew what that meant, but now I really know what that means. And like, that was one of those moments for me when, when God opened my eyes to the greatness of what he was saying here. When he was saying here, when he granted to us everything that I need, that I lack nothing, that I don't need a, a second blessing I don't need this, a, new, a new fulfillment of anything else that when he saved me, he gave me everything that I need. And my eyes were open at that point, And I remember it hit me like a train. And I'm like, whoa, I lack nothing. But how is this divine power administered? Because look what he says there. Right after that, he says it's through whom? Through the knowledge of him. But he doesn't say just the knowledge of him. He says through the true knowledge he, he kind of emphasizes here that this is not just mental ascent knowledge. This is just the knowledge, something you just know about, but this is true knowledge. He adds a, a, a prefix on it to emphasize the importance. How is this given? Through the true, the saving knowledge of him. And who's him? It's Christ who called us by his own glory and excellence. That when he called you by his own glory and excellence, by his own glory and his excellence as a man, his glory as God, excellence as a man, when he called you to himself, that true knowledge of him was opened in your eyes that you saw who Christ was. And he gave you everything at that point. That believer, I want you to hear this. Believer, everything that you will need between the time of your salvation And the future time of your glorification has already been supplied to you by Christ's power. Do you hear that? Everything that you will need. That this is not just obviously like a mental ascent knowledge, but he's saying here that through the saving knowledge of Christ, 
Everything that you will need to live a godly life has been supplied to you. That there is nothing currently in now or in the future. There is no struggle that you will encounter. There is nothing that God has not already supplied to you by his grace. So that means in my struggles, in my weaknesses, in some of the hardest things that God will place in your life, He has given you everything that you need to walk through that in a way that will please him. Now, he has supplied everything to us. It doesn't mean we're perfected already, right? Are you perfect? Do you still struggle? And the reason why we struggle is because although this is true, everything we need to supply to us, what we often do is we walk by our flesh and not by the Spirit, But everything you need is supplied to you. And what you need to understand, believer, is that he has given to you everything that you need, that if you walk by faith, you can walk through anything in your life in a way that will please and honor Christ. Because he granted it to you, right? It's not something that you're doing. It's something that he's doing and he did in you and he's going to do it through you. And notice how he says here, he called us by his own glory and excellence. It was by Christ's own merits that he did this. And so that his own praise is magnified. That he called you out by his glory, by his excellence, so that when God is drawing a sinner to himself, we not only see God's glory as God, but we see Christ's glory as a man, his excellence as a man. That we see Christ, the perfect Savior, truly God, truly man, And it's by his own merits that he calls us. So to know your nature means to know who you are. You must know that when he gave you new life, he gave you his spirit. That the spirit of God is dwelling within you. It's abiding with you. Because he says right after that here, it is verse 4, by these... He has granted to us precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So when he called you to himself, in other words, he he opened your eyes to see Christ's glory, to see his excellence there. He drew you to himself. He gave you everything you need. And not only that, he says, it's by these he gave you precious and magnificent promises. But what do you do with these magnificent promises? What do you say with that right after that? So that by them, you may become partakers of the divine nature. That now as a child of God, the child of God is now a partaker in the divine nature. I want you to stop and think about that. That as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, is that if you're in Christ, you're a what? Anyone know? For those who are in Christ, you are a new creation, that the old has gone away, all things are made new, that if you're in Christ, you are a a new creation. And now in Christ, you become a part of the divine nature. You don't become God's little gods, like as some cults teach, but you become partakers of the divine nature. Then now you have eternal life, everlasting life, because he granted to you these great, magnificent promises, all that we don't even have time to talk about this evening. But he gave to you great promises, magnificent promises, uh, just a few to name, forgiveness of sins, the righteousness of Christ, the, the, the ability to walk in a Christian life that pleases God. He's given you his, his, his hope. He's given you strength. He's, he's fortified you. He puts your feet on solid ground. He's given you joy everlasting. He's given you peace that surpasses all understanding. He has given you so many magnificent and great promises that he's, he's given to you. And in all of these things, you will partake of because now you are part of the divine nature. You are now a new creation. And because we are partakers of God's nature, we now share in his moral victory over sin. In this life, and we share in his glorious victory over death and eternal life. That because now the promise of the new birth that he promised us, the promise of God's protecting power, the promise of God's enabling power, believers can participate now in the divine nature. That we become more like Christ. This is again like the picture of going to battle. That the reason why you have any hope in winning this battle is not because you're so strong. 
Like, you don't have the strength in and of yourself. But what do you have? You have infinite, eternal resources that are available to you by Christ's power. And those, those resources are available to you every single breathing moment of your life. So why can you please God no matter where you find yourself? Because his promises, he has granted to you everything that you need. Everything. You are amply supplied with everything. So you fight because you have everything you need. You do not fight in order to earn what you need. You fight now. You stand in what you have in Christ. Let me, let me, let me reiterate this again. If we miss this first point here, which I'm spending more time on, this is so crucial for us to understand, to know your nature. Why can you live a pleasing life to God? Because he has given to you everything that you need to do so. Now, we're going to learn about all those resources and what that looks like practically. But one of the main resources he's given to us is his sufficient word. And how much do I need to be reminded and renewed in my own spirit of what is true of me? Because I don't know about you, but when I'm struggling, when I'm, when I'm fighting my own sin, when I'm just in the trenches, do you know what I need? I need to know truth. Because what I'm really dealing with right that in that moment, I'm dealing that with my flesh once. I'm dealing with what I think is more powerful than me, like my flesh, my desires, maybe the world around me. These things which are pulling at my heart, pulling at my desires. Do you know what I need in those moments? I need to be reminded of who I am. I need to realize here that, wait a minute, no temptation has come to me except what is common to man. That I'm not the only one dealing with this. This These are common struggles. I feel like I'm alone. I'm not alone. But even not, not only am I not alone, but he has given me a way so I can stand up under this. That there is no anger that has to overcome me. No sin has to overcome me. That he has always supplied with that trial a way for me to stand so that I do not have to get in. So you know what I need at that moment? I don't need strength. Like, I don't need more muscles. I need to remember what's been given to me. I need to remember my nature. That I've been given everything that I need to please God. I lack nothing. And when we understand this, we're walking by faith. Because I'm no longer walking by what I think is right. I'm no longer walking by my strength, but I'm walking by faith because I'm trusting in what? God's promises, not my own strength. You catch that? Understand your nature. So when I say you need to know your nature, I'm saying we need to understand who you are. And so as we talk about maturing in Christ, I'm talking about where we need to understand who we are. Because when you understand your nature, then you can walk in Christ in the right way. You're pressing in then to what he's already gifted to you. He's granted it to you, all right? To know your nature. You got to remind it of that. Here's a second reminder is remember your responsibility. Remember your responsibility. Because look how he affirms, he follows up with this, right? He follows up saying, by these he's granted to us precious and magnificent promises. We escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now look what he says here in verse 5. Look how he follows up with that. He says, Now for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence. Now, he says this for this very reason, or we can say because you have been given divine power, because you have been transformed, like here, this is what you got to catch. Because you have everything, because you've been gifted these magnificent promises, because of your nature, what is he saying now? Walk in it. Walk in it. Walk like it, we can say. Because now, if this is true, if in a believer, if, if you have a new nature, if you've been granted everything you need, here's the danger. We're not called to be passive. Like the Christian life is not a passive life. In other words, what I mean, I have everything I need. I'm elect, so I don't need to do anything. I can just, I can just do whatever I want. Like I can, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go to church. Yeah, I'm going to read my Bible, but you know, I'm just going to just coast now. I'm going to be just take it easy. I got to 
put it down on a second gear now. I'm, I'm fine. If you've been given a new nature, Peter here is saying now, look how he follows that up with, for this very reason, because of what God has granted to you, because of who you are, what is he saying here? The very first command now in this book, the very first command for us, because of who you are, he says, what verb? Anyone catch the verb there, verse 5? What's the verb? Because of who you are, what's the command? Shout it out if you got it. What is it? Shout it out. You got What would you say? Apply. Apply, supply, depending on your translation, right? Supply, right? Supplement, in other words. You know, every day, like especially this week, what I've been taking every single day, I've been taking supplements, you guys ever take supplements, vitamins, depending on like who, what type of family you are, especially where I live on the Central Coast? We got a lot of people, we call them uh, granola people. <laughs> I don't know if there are many in Bakersfield, but in the Central Coast, you got like people on the beach, you know, people who are just like, not, I don't want to call them hippies, but we just call them granola people because I come from like SoCal, so I'm not really on board with that. But there's some things you won me over with. And a lot of these granola people, what they like is they, they like their supplements. <laughs> and they like to be healthy. And they, they don't want, like, the, the, the fabricated way. They want the organic, right? It's got to be organic. Um, and some of the things here, people go way far over. But that's a discussion for another time. <laughs> but the supplements here, I'm taking supplements. And I'm taking these supplements not because I don't have already these things in my body. But I'm taking these supplements to what? to add to what I already have, right? I'm taking it to build on what already I have. I'm not taking it to get something I don't already have. I'm taking it to build, to strengthen what I have. And so what Peter's saying here, he says, God has given you everything you need to to please him, no matter the temptation, no matter the struggle, no matter the trial. I don't care what you're in right now. However you are today, it does not matter because God has given to you everything you need to walk through it well. And our problem is we need to understand the truth of how we can walk through this. But now he says, because you have been given everything you need, because his power has been given to you everything, now supply. Now grow. Grow in it. So what's your responsibility? Your responsibility is to grow now to work because God has given you everything you need. Now use all of your strength to grow. This is like the picture of first uh, Philippians chapter two, verse 12, that work out your salvation with what? With fear and trembling, trembling, for it is God who's working in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, you're not working out your salvation to earn your salvation. In other words, because you have been given salvation, Paul says, work it out. And why? It is God who's working in you to will and to work. In other words, God's working in you to will, which means to desire, so that God works in you as you grow to actually desire to please God. God is working in you to give you a more taste of Christ. I want more of Christ. I want more of him. God is working in you to will, to desire, and to work for his good pleasure. And so Peter here is saying, in his own way, God has given you everything you need to grow, and now supply in your faith. Grow in your faith. He has given you everything, so now walk like it. To supply further, you can say. In other words, to lavishly pour out everything. If you have a plant, you plant it in your yard, and you expect it to grow. Now, it'll grow, but it doesn't mean you won't feed it. You water it, you give it fertilizer, and all these things are needed for that plant to thrive. The power of the growth is not in your hands and not in your power, but you're still called to nurture that plant so it can grow. So in a real way, God is working in us. But Paul, in, the, in 1 Philippians chapter 2, he tells us that we need to work out. And here, Paul, Peter is saying here, because God has given to you everything, and now you need to supply. You need to grow. Now, he says here in the following verses, verses 6 through 7, he gives a list of like various virtues. He says, in your faith, supply moral excellence. In your moral excellence, supply uh, knowledge. In your knowledge, self-control. In your self-control, perseverance. In your perseverance, godliness. In, brother, in, your, in your perseverance, when the godliness, your godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. He gives the whole list of these, these virtues here. 
I don't want to spend too much time about like what these virtues are, but I want to pay attention to the structure of them. Like, look how he's giving the structure of these virtues for us. Because he's saying here now, because God has given you everything, now supply, supply further these things. He says, in your faith, supply moral excellence. Now, there are many people who have different views on what Peter's doing in these virtues. Like, why is he listing them in this order? What is he doing? Why is he calling out these virtues but not this one? Like, what is Peter doing here? There are countless reasons we can discuss here, but one thing I want to look at is just the general structure of them. He does begin with, in your faith, moral excellence, and the last virtue he gives is what? What's the last virtue in that list? What is it? Love, love right? He, gives, he starts with, with, with moral excellence. He ends with love. In a very real, real way, he kind of begins this list with internal qualities of moral excellence, knowledge, perseverance, but then ends it out in exterior actions, brotherly kindness and love, which does flow out, where it seems like he's moving here like from the interior qualities and how these interior qualities now impact your actions. It starts with you and God and also you and man. In other words, loving God and loving man. That's just one basic observation. But one thing I don't want us to do with these qualities here, it's not like a step, a staircase, right? Where he's saying now, in your faith, supply moral excellence. So now the first thing I come to Christ, I got to work on moral excellence. Then you get in a fight the next day, like, hey, well, what happened? Well, I'm working on brotherly kindness like next year, right? <laughs> like I'm just starting with moral excellence for right now. I'm going to get to brotherly kindness later. Like that's not what he's saying here. Like you work on one, now stage two. Oh, you're on stage four? I'm only on stage three, right? That's not what he's getting at here. In other words, he's, he's almost giving like these lists like the fruits of the Spirit, right? He's not neglecting or saying one is more important than the other, but really what he's doing here is saying here, these are the virtues here to pursue, pursue them, pursue all of them, pursue brotherly kindness, pursue moral excellence, pursue love, pursue all of these things here. And his whole point here is to grow in Christ's likeness. Like that's what he's getting at here. And since he uses the command supply, it does imply that there should already be these qualities here. Like you think about that. He said God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. And now he's saying here in this supply, which implies, believer, that these qualities are with you. And why? Because these are ultimately, this all work of the spirit. And because you have the, the spirit within you, you have these qualities. But what he's saying here, he's not arguing that you have these qualities. But what is he arguing for? For you to nurture, to grow in these qualities. Because you have everything, now supply further in what you have. You press into these truths, grow in these truths. You've already been given these qualities by the power of God. So you don't need to earn or establish these qualities yourselves. It's not a step-by-step process. It's not a works-based system. But in other words, he's saying, grow in what you have been given. I'm going to spend just a a few minutes here just looking at these qualities just for the, just mean to know, like, what is he actually talking about? When he's talking about moral excellence, he's saying, in your faith, supply moral excellence. This is another word for virtue. Um, It's a term used for moral uh, heroism, or you can say it in this way, this is right conduct under discipline, doing the right thing because of self-discipline. 2 Corinthians 5.9 says that therefore we have as our ambition, whether we're at home or away, to be pleasing to him. That this moral excellence involves doing the right thing under right discipline. It's having the right conduct and doing the right thing to please God. And how do I practically apply these? He says, with moral excellence, what do you supply? Supply knowledge. He says, in your moral excellence, supply knowledge. And what knowledge is he talking about here? This is the different word he's using from earlier here, but this really knowledge here is is truth properly understood and applied. He's not just talking about just a head knowledge here, but he's talking about a knowledge that we have that is not only known to us, but now we actually apply it. This is not necessarily saving knowledge here, but this is knowledge of the truth, where now you're learning God's truth, and you're knowing it and actually applying it. And this is actually key in this book here, because a big context of what's going on in 2 Peter here is that Peter is speaking against false teachers that are rising up in the church. 
And if you ever see it, whenever false teachers rise to the surface, it impacts the Christians and their living because they're being fed false lies. And that really interrupts their life. And if they're a true Christian, it will stunt them in their growth. And if they're a false Christian, it'll lead them astray and harden them even further. But Peter, what he's doing here, he's speaking against these false teachings that are rising up in the church. And he's saying here, in your faith, add moral excellence, but also knowledge so that you know the truth. And you not only know it, but you actually live it out. But with that knowledge, he says, supply self-control. Because think about it. Here, you can say you, you, you have all the truth of Scripture. You know it all. You know all the doctrines. You know all the ten areas of systematic theology. But here, he follows up that, that with knowledge. He says, supply what? Self-control. You can have all this knowledge of, of truth, all this knowledge of theology, but if it doesn't impact you where you have self-control, where you actually have right conduct under right control, this knowledge isn't, means nothing. I don't care how much you know, but if it does not produce self-control in you, where now you realize why you can have self-control, because you know your nature, you know who you are, but yet you have all this knowledge and it doesn't produce self-control, but really the question is, do you really have this knowledge? Or is it just head knowledge? You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you can't apply it, it's worthless. You ever see a picture of, um, or a picture, you ever see just the training of Olympics, Olympiast, Olympiast? No, not Olympiast. Olympians, thank you. I'm like, no, I'm missing something. You ever see the, the, the training of Olympians? Like, they don't eat anything, right? Unless you're Michael Phelps, then you eat everything. But, but, but an Olympian, like, they're very careful about what they eat. They're very careful. And you know why they're careful? Because they realize everything that I take in is going to impact what I put out. That if I eat garbage, I'm going to produce garbage in my performance, they're very careful about taking, careful on how many calories they take, what kind of nutrition they, they have, like a nutrition coach. Now that, that nutrition coach has a nu- nutrition coach itself. Like it's, it's crazy the fabric that they have in order to be trained for this grand sport. But you know why they're under self, such, self, self control, such self-control? It's because they realize how much that impacts the performance. And the most dangerous thing for a believer can be to have all the knowledge of the world But yet, without self-control, it really does nothing. And so he's saying here, with all these things, supply self-control as well. And why can you even do all this? Let's stop and remember, why are you doing this? He's not just calling you to work by your own strength, but why can you produce moral excellence and grow moral excellence? Why can you grow in knowledge? Why can you grow in self-control? Why can you do any of this? Because his divine power has granted to you what? Everything you need. For life and godliness. So why can you grow? Because you have been gifted this already and you still have it. And so you pursue it day after day after day and you grow in what God has given to you. Now, in your self-control, he says, supply perseverance. This is patience. This is endurance. This is steadfastness. The the fortitude of the Christian life where now you're persevering through the Christian life through trials, through heartaches, no matter what God brings your way, the reason why you can grow and pursue all of these things is because you realize he has given me everything I need. I need to be renewed in my mind, and I walk through it and grow in perseverance so that when the next hurdle comes, I jump over it because I realize the promises of God. And not only do I realize those promises, but I realize how great these promises are, and I jump over the next hurdle by God's power alone. In 2 Peter, they need to learn to stand firm in their commitment in the face of this, the enticements of false teaching and the, and the enticement of, of, of trials, of all these things that were facing them. But in spite of these trials, in spite of tribulations, the calling for us, brothers and sisters, is to stand firm. Why? Because his divine power. Now, he goes on in your perseverance, supply godliness which is just a very practical awareness of God in every aspect of our life. To be godly is what you would think. He, this person is godly because they are aware of God is present. Like whenever they're with him, their, 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 their conduct is informed by this. Their speech is informed by this. What they watch in secret is informed by this. What they speak to one another, everything they do is, is godly. Why? Because they realize God is here. I am in the presence of God. And so grow in this godliness. It's the Christian manner of life which keeps Christ's return constantly in view. 
which helps us persevere in temptation and we look forward towards something. In your godliness, he says, brotherly kindness. Here, this is where we get the word, you know, from the, the, the city of Philadelphia, which means a city of brotherly love. This is the word he uses here, Philadelphia. But he says here, pursue brotherly kindness. This is love for the brethren, to grow in that love for the brethren. And it literally means love for brother and sister. And this is because you have now a new family of God. And when God calls you to the kingdom, you now have family. And who's this family? It's not just your biological family, unless they're in Christ. But he's saying this new family is the brothers and sisters that God has called you to. So, so how do I pursue? How do I grow? I grow in seeking how can I love my brothers and sisters. Here in this room, how can I love them? This list ends with adding to your brotherly kindness love. And this love is the agape love, this unconditional love. It's unmerited. This, this is the type of love that God displays toward his beloved. This unconditional love that is not contingent upon what you receive from others, but you give this love because of the unconditional love God has given to you. That's why 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says that anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. The mark of the Christian is to love. And it's whoever does not love, he's saying here, the consistent mark of life of love, if that mark is not in your life, if you are marked with hostility, if you're marked with gossip, if you're marked with hatred, if you're marked with just animosity toward people, and that's just the mark of your life, that should be a question to see, wait, have I understood? Have I truly understood God's power that's been granted to me? Am I truly born again? Because he says here, the one who loves Loves because God is love. But he says for the believers to grow in this love. So add all this. And all these in your, in your moral excellence, knowledge, in your knowledge, self-control, in your self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Now I want to just reiterate again that these qualities here, these are not recommendations. Did you hear me on that? These qualities, these are not recommendations. He does not suggest for us, you should consider growing in moral excellence. This is something you should, you should think about. These are not recommendations. They're commands, and we are to grow in them. Not only possess them, because the true believer already possesses them, but he says to supply and grow. And here is some of where the door begins to open a little bit more for us. Because look what he says in verse 8. If these qualities he's talking about here, he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, then what? They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want to know how to live an abundantly fruitful life for Christ? Do you want to know how can you live a fruitful, abundantly, abundantly fruitful life in Christ? He says here, if these are yours, and are increasing, you will neither be ineffective or useless. If you make it your ambition in Christ to pursue godliness, to pursue these qualities, if you pursue these things in your life, God says you will never be ineffective. You will never be unfruitful. Because what God does in you is he nurtures these in you so that you produce the fruit that he wants you to produce, and you will never be ineffective. There are many other ways that people talk about growing in Christ. Here, here this secret knowledge. Do this, do this, do that. And some of these things are probably pretty good, but really what it should anchor on here is understanding your nature, and because of your nature, your responsibility to press in to what God has given to you and to grow in who he is and what he's granted to you. And if you pursue this, you will never, ever, ever have an ineffective life in Christ. He says you'll never be unfruitful. That's a promise. So why this random list? I think the one reason here is that in our daily living, when I'm struggling uh, when I'm struggling with a difficult relationship, struggling with sin, if, I, if I'm overwhelmed by something, it's in these virtues here that I realize I'm lacking and I must pursue. Because, in other words, if I'm, if I'm failing, if I'm weak, I realize, Lord, I'm not godly because I'm not living as though you're not present here. 
If I'm struggling with self-control, I realize, Lord, I feel as though my flesh is more powerful than your spirit. In other words, these virtues point out what my need is in Christ because these virtues ultimately point to Christ because he is all of these things and more. In Christ, I have everything. And so what these virtues do in, in, in the Christian life is it points out my need of where I need to press into who Christ is. Lord, teach me what it means to have brotherly love towards someone who does not treat me the way that they should treat me. Well, how do I learn this? Well, Christ, you, while hanging on the cross, were mocked, were spat upon, made fun of. You did not return and and mock others. But what did you do, Christ? You entrusted yourself to the one who judges justly. You entrusted yourself to God. So how can I produce brotherly love here in this relationship when someone is always talking about me, always making it difficult for me to love them? I remember the Christ who died for me, who was spat upon and mocked, and he did not mock in return. I remember the Christ who who came for me and died and rose again for me and bore the wrath of God in my place and suffered in my place and did not complain once. I need to remember who Christ is. And when I remember that, I realize, whoa, this is all that I have in Christ. So how can I grow now? I grow because I remember Christ. I need to grow in brotherly love, Lord. What am I missing in my personal holiness that is leading me toward this same sin repeatedly? Like, what am I missing here? That I go to the Lord, I know who you are, I know your truth, but what am I missing here, Lord? Teach me what it means to have self-control. Lord, teach me what it means to have moral excellence. Teach me these things, because I know them, I do possess them, but Lord, I'm struggling here. And what he's saying here is, is you supply, you pursue these things so that you will never be ineffective. So do you want to know how to be a helpful, spirit-filled, effective member of your local body at your church? You work on your personal holiness. You pursue your personal holiness. Work on maturing in your faith by abundantly growing in these qualities. And again, like I said, we're just scratching the surface of what that even means. But because he's speaking to the believer, Paul says in verse 9, He says, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his his purifications from his former sins. This is a picture of one without glasses squinting so much they can barely see. Now, really here, there's there's different issues or different views of how people view, like, what is he talking about here? But essentially, what I think we can safely say here, he's saying that if these qualities... He who lacks these qualities, literally you can say, whoever does not have these qualities, he's saying that they're blind, in other words, short-sighted, forgiving, having forgotten their purification from their former sins. In other words, if these qualities are not present, then what is likely true of this person here, especially in the context here, he's talking about salvation, is this person here is so blind. It's like the picture of someone who takes off their glasses and they're squinting. And you see them, like, trying to look at something, and they're they're seeing. But really, the picture here is that they're short-sighted, but they're blind, forgotten their purification, their their former sins. This person here is probably in the church, maybe even been baptized, professed Christ, professed cleansing, but there was never any change in their life. There was never any change, no new desires, no new affections for Christ. And really, they never produce any of these virtues. And why is that? Because it was just a false profession of faith. And this person here does not have these qualities and they are blind and not realizing here that he says here, forgotten their purification, their sins. In other words, they've forgotten really and did not really know Christ truly. Because it says right after this, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain of his election, make certain of his choosing you, which we'll get to. So I think he was referring to someone who professes Christ, does not bear fruit, and therefore has no assurance of their salvation because now they realize there's no fruit, which may indicate a false faith. You know your nature, remember your responsibility, but thirdly here, confirm your calling. Confirm your calling. You have to know your nature, remember your responsibility, Confirm your calling. Again, this is the believers now to confirm your calling. This is why our third strategy of grow, um, to grow in this faith is so important. 
Because we've covered, you need to know your nature, you need to remember responsibility, but you need to confirm your calling. Let me ask you a personal question. If you were to examine the last, I don't know, year of your life, last two years of your life, if you've been born again that long, have you seen growth in your life? Have you seen growth? Last year, last several months, have you seen growth? If yes, praise God. But look what he says in verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will abundantly be supplied to you. Why would he say, another command here, he says, to make certain. To make certain. In other words, confirm his calling. This is the second command in this passage. The first command, supply. The second command here, to, in other words, to be all the more diligent. Why would he ask the believer to confirm here your calling? This is strange, because if I'm already in Christ, why don't I need to confirm it? What he's saying here is if you're in Christ, you profess to know Christ, you must here confirm, make sure God's choosing you. And what that does here is when you grow in faith, what do you see? You see fruit in your life. Because what happened? You've grown in what Christ has done for you. You understand the grand promises God has done, all he's given to you. And now you desire to follow Christ. And so you press into these truths. You follow Christ. You love Christ for more of who he is. You realize all that he's given to you to grow in Christ. And then you begin to produce fruit because he's working in you. And then what does that do? It produces assurance that you are Christ's. It produces assurance that you are Christ. That's why believers who are, are in sin, in unrepentant sin, they struggle with their salvation. But he's saying here, make certain he's calling you. In other words, he's commanding you to, to, in other words, to test, to examine yourself. Because as you do so, what are you examining here? You're not looking for subjective feelings, I feel like I'm saved. But you're looking here, what has God done in me? I didn't do this. I didn't have these new, I didn't give myself these new desires. I didn't give myself this new taste. God did it in me. He's grown me. Where He's now worked in me greater depths of patience, greater desires of godliness, more self-control. I'm not where I should be. Hey, but I'm not where I was a couple years ago, right? I have different desires. I've grown here than where I was years ago. And what that does here, it doesn't give us this own self, like self-confidence, but it gives me confidence in what Christ has done in me. And so what he's saying here, believer, is to make certain his choosing you. And so the call to, to believers, everyone in the church, is to make certain his calling you. In other words, if you say you're elect, if God has saved you, then make certain of that choosing. And how do you do that? One way is seeing what has God done in you in changing your desires and affections, and what fruit has he produced in you, and how has he grown you over recent lives, over the recent of your life. You don't want to look at just the last week. Don't look at the last month, but look at just a significant period of time. Like, how has God worked in you? How, this is where you pull in people who know you. Have you seen changes in me? Have you seen God working in me? Do, do you see uh, in, me, in me genuine desires to honor Christ? Because if there's no changes in your life since you profess to come to Christ, then that should be a wake-up call to maybe think, do I know this Christ? Have I truly been saved by this Christ? And the hope is, If that's you, then you know, like, this very evening, he'll save you now if you come to him in humility. But he's saying here is to confirm your election. Make sure of it. So how do you confirm if you're elect? Well, first, do you have objective faith in this Christ? Are you trusting in this Christ? If you were to die today, what is your hope that you were to be with him? That's one aspect. The second aspect, according to Peter, is this evidence of growth. Do you see God working in these things? So make certain his calling. Confirm your calling. Confirm his choosing you. Because he says, if you practice this, you will never stumble, he says. And what he's saying there, not stumble I mean like you're never going to sin, but you're never going to stumble in whether, or not you're con- in whether or not you're questioning your salvation. 
That you never stumble in wondering, am I truly saved? And why won't you stumble? Because you realize this is all God working in me. There's no explanation for what God is doing in me but the Spirit of God. And so if you confirm your election, confirm your calling by seeing the fruits and evidences that the Spirit's working in you, you'll never stumble in wondering, am I truly Christ? Am I in Christ? Because realize, you realize when you come to the end of it, and the more you grow in Christ, you realize how small and insignificant you are, but how great Christ is. And you realize, at the end of the day, all I have is Christ. I'm not going to stumble in that because I realize who Christ is, and I know he's one who keeps his promises. And so you'll never stumble in wondering, am I Christ? Because you see the, 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 the objective sign of his work working in, through, working in you through the Spirit of God. And in verse 10, he indicates that you practice practices these things in you. And in verse 11, it's this way that the entrance into the eternal kingdom of God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. In other words here, this is the path to have the full assurance of hope of the eternal kingdom of God. That is through this way that as the believer who knows his nature, is, understands and reminded of his responsibility and confirms his calling there, the subsequent result is heaven because it's given to them by Christ alone. They didn't work for it. They didn't earn it. It was given to them by Christ. Christ worked in them. They're confident in that. And it's this way that the kingdom of God is given to us. It's through Christ. It's through Christ. So to grow in Christ... It is necessary for us to know your nature, remember your responsibility, confirm your calling. If you lose this, if you lose these truths, you will be stagnant. Believer in Christ, you must know who you are. You must remember your responsibility. You must confirm your election because as you do that, that's what God uses to grow you. So we're commanded to grow. And if you're in Christ, you have been enabled to grow. And so as we head into this weekend, I just want to address one of the most crucial elements in growing in Christ. Because without this, there is no hope. But for tonight, well, you must realize that why you can grow and why that's been gifted to you. The only reason you can grow is because of what God has done for you in Christ. If you miss this bus, you miss it all. And so what I don't want anyone going to bed tonight thinking is, in order to grow in Christ, I must work harder you think that, you've missed it. If you want to go in Christ, you first have to understand what has been gifted to you in Christ. What has he graciously given to you in his son? What has he given to you? And because of what he's given to you, now he's saying, because of everything you have, now work with all your strength to grow in that. And as you do that, you see the Spirit of God working in you. And as he works in you, he produces fruit so that you see the confidence of Christ working in you and the confidence to grow in even more depths than that so that you please Christ in every way. And you realize at the end of the day, there is no other hope but Christ and Christ alone. If you understand this, you're off to the right start of growing in Christ Know who you are. Know why you can grow. And as we'll look at even tomorrow, we're going to look at what are some of the most crucial ways to now for me to grow in this truth. If this is true now, how do I put flight to this? And that's what we're going to be going to look at starting tomorrow is how do I begin to grow in Christ? How do I know him and love him more? How do I nurture these truths in me so that I just don't know them, but God works them into me so that I know them? And that's what I want for you, for us to walk away with how do we grow in Christ now. These are grand promises from God's mouth, not mine. And I want you to know what God has given to you, believer. And again, if if you don't know this Christ, if you're unsure of this Christ, you must know clear the gospel of this Christ. That we are born into sin, born under the wrath of God, that the wrath of God abides under the unbeliever. But God sent his son, the perfect son of God, Christ, who lived the perfect life, never sinning against God in his mind, in his thought, in his actions. He lived the perfect life, pleasing God in a way we never could. And he went to the cross willingly, laying his life down as a ransom, bearing the wrath of God for sin, so that when God looks upon the sinner, the only justification the sinner has before God is Christ, Christ crucified. 
And so God sent his son. Christ went willingly to the cross. He died on the cross and he was buried and he was resurrected on the third day. According to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven in the cloud. He is sitting right now on the right hand of the father and he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're unsure where you stand with that, then what you must know tonight as we go is that you can receive this Christ tonight. He can be yours right now. You see his glory, see your filth, but realize the only solution for your filth is his righteousness, which he gives to anyone. And so come to this Christ. If you're unsure, talk to your leader, talk to me, talk to Pastor David, talk to anybody about this Christ who's willing to save. But I want us to understand, even for us believers, to hear that gospel message, we're never going to grow out of it. We're just going to grow into it. And to understand all that Christ has done for you should give you leaps of joy because that's why you can grow in Christ, because of what he's done. We're going to begin to see that, but I'm going to pray, and I'll pass it off Pastor David. But let's pray. Father God, we do thank you again for these truths. And Lord, we realize here that you have given to us everything that we need for life and godliness. And because you've given to us everything we need, we can grow. And so, Father, we know we can't grow apart from you. So I pray, Lord, that you would work in us to desire and to work for your good pleasure. I pray, God, that you would work in us, that you would give us deeper depths, more hunger for you, a greater thirst for you, so that, Lord, that we would love you more, walk after you, and that by your Spirit you would sanctify and even save to the uttermost. So, Father, we lift this whole weekend up to you, asking, God, that you would work in us whatever you have willed to work in us, that we would walk away from this camp loving the Lord Jesus Christ more because of who he is and what he's done. And so, Lord, we ask this in his name. Amen.